working with the Atlas Network internationally and working with hundreds of partners uh, from all around the world. Uh, for this presentation, we're going to have two uh, uh, presentations on the state of liberty and the, the uh, activities necessary to advance it in two, <coughs> two rather small uh, countries from the region. And because they're so tiny, they represent the microcosm of the Liberty Challenge, uh, those being uh, India and China. All of you have the bios, so I won't uh, go through the biographical material. I'll add a little bit of the texture and color of what it's like to be able to work with people such as this. First speaker will be Yelian Shah. For those who are unacquainted with the name Shah, his family name, Yelian or David, uh, the given name. He's an outstanding economist in China, rose absolutely to the top of the profession at Peking University, which is some rivalry like between Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, in China as to which is the top. Uh, but uh, one of the one or two top universities uh, in China, very active with a number of uh, classical liberal libertarian think tanks, and had become increasingly outspoken about the lack of accountability in government, about the need for openness, about the need for uh, a real free society, and that uh, economic growth was wonderful, but it was not sustainable with the right institutions, and also those institutions were desirable in their own right. And as a consequence, as they said, his contract was not renewed, and it was put all over the internet that he was a terrible teacher, which is the reason that students flocked to his courses, uh, and why he was a regular commentator on television on economic matters. He uh, is now at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Our second speaker, Parth Shah, uh, again his bio I won't go through, but I will mention that Parth had a great career in the United States teaching economics at the University of Michigan and decided that uh, the time was now for India uh, to experience a taste of freedom and to be able to enjoy those institutions and return to India, established the Center for Civil Society. He's a great institution builder. So many institutions in India that have now spun off of CCS. I should mention one of the great things they're doing, and this is a wonderful book, there's copies over there, is the promotion of independent and low budget schools, which in some countries would be called private schools. But they focus, these are independent and they're for the poor. These are low budget schools. It's an astonishing story. And Parth and his team have been at the center of one of the greatest movements of liberation of humanity in all of human history that is unfolding before our eyes. So for our first presentation, David. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very much, I feel much honored to have the uh, opportunity to speak about China. And as everybody knows, that uh, since President Xi got the power, all the power, as <laughs> people joke about his uh, uh, way of uh, uh, grasping power with uh, many titles of the group leaders. So far, he got nine group leaders. Uh, each group in charge of a certain field or area. Uh, so it's very unusual because China has so many uh, formal positions for high ranking or top leaders. Uh, but still, they need it's a, a very special organization to implement his. Uh, whether his goal or his uh, assignments. So uh, each Chinese leader, new leader, normally gave her his own theory, so-called theory. If that's not theory, then they have to make it. Uh, for instance, people know that uh, at uh, 
present geometry means time. The theory is called the three representatives. The representatives, in some way, in Chinese pronunciation as the biao. Biao is similar with the pronunciation of the watches. Uh, so people just joking about the theory say, oh, wearing three watches at your wrist <laughs> at the same time. And then it became uh, President Hu Jintao's time. And then the theory is called so-called harmonious society. Or scientific views or ideas of development. So people found those theories are not, not even in the form like a theory at all. But anyway, they, they have to find some new thing to make them make them themselves distinguished from other people. So now it's time for Xi Jinping, and he got a new theory, it's called the Chinese dream. Uh, people can estimate that it comes from the American dream. It's comparable, so it seems to be. But people know that also the American dream is actually dream for individuals. That's non official one. It's not designated by the president himself. But in China it's different. The Chinese dream is a proposed and designated by Xi himself without negotiation with every individual. So that's a national task or aim at his at least his term. His terms it could be two terms, normally it's two terms each for five years, so two terms make ten years. So it's a kind of regular presidency for Chinese leaders. So my question is, what does it mean by the Chinese nation? Because uh, uh, it's so-called the Chinese dream is uh, the goal is to have the great resuscitation of the Chinese nation. At first, people got puzzled. Who is the Chinese nation? We have uh, 55 different nations altogether. Some are called as minorities, or just people think the Han is the most important one. So, except apart from Han nation, the other ones all can call minorities. So even uh, Tibetans or Vigors or some other Mongolians and so on and so forth. Um, if you say it's a Han nation stream, so how about the others? Tibetans, Vigors and the Mongolians, what their dreams are. And if you say it's a kind of resuscitation for a certain period of time, so which time, which period of time in Chinese history? Um, people know in Han Dynasty, it's quite strong period of time, and also Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty. By Qing Dynasty, at the first, uh, third, or fourth, it could be still think powerful, and later on it's quite weak or vulnerable. So it's not certain. The second question is, as I mentioned, is which period of the history is the aim of the resuscitation. Uh, the official explanation didn't tell us about what we should we should do or focus on. And third one, third question is what is the symbol, criteria, and measurement for the resuscitation? In what way we can say we reach that goal? It's also unclear. So if you if President Xi gave the Chinese dream, and it seems to be that every people should follow this goal. But meanwhile, the goal or the picture is not clear. So what is the dream should be? I will say whether it's uh, as, a, as my, uh, the title says, whether it's a reverie or it's a nightmare. <laughs> So next one say, what the party state advocates nowadays? And um, if you record in the past several decades, at uh, yeah, first from 1949 to 1979, for the last three decades, people 
suppose, are supposed to believe in communism and socialism. But nowadays, no more. Not only the ordinary individuals, but even with the top leaders themselves. Do you think they really believe in communism or socialism? People cannot see anything from that. And they cannot even recite those paragraphs by Marx, Karl Marx, and Lenin anymore. And then Xiaoping, when he said about uh, the Marxism classic, classics, he said, uh, the only book about those things I read is Manifesto of Communism. He said, that I read very little. And Chairman Mao always called on people to learn Marxism. He said that you should read the classicals written by Karl Marx. But later on, when he died, people tried to find some books which he likes to make a notebook, notes on that, remarks, and to show his uh, uh, eagerness to learn Marxism, to have the demonstration or exhibition on that. But people failed to find any various evidence that he read a lot. So only a few lines or commands. The most familiar works, classicals for him, is some novels, Chinese ancient novels. Get, uh, uh, all brothers, uh, all men are brothers, and uh, dream of red mansion, so on and so forth. So it's all cheating. So they, they are not really followers or believers of communism. Uh, nowadays, I would say the party state that actually advocate, advocates nationalism, populism, patriotism, <laughs> Sorry, that the last one should be militarism. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> militarism. <laughs> and that's misspelling. <laughs> Yet he meant more on practice. And since John's time, John's his famous saying to his own person is, "Don't speak loud. Just make fortune by yourself." That's very famous. In Chinese, it's called the Men Shen Fa Da Cai. So that's his goal. He's uh, uh, so nowadays the leaders actually demand practice, opportunism, and fascism because uh, when the military forces expanded so much, it shows something. And even the way of the suppression for the Chinese dissidents. So democracy with the party and mass democracy. Uh, that's uh, what they promote. They said that's our democracy. Who said in China there's no democracy? We have the democracy. But what they meant is uh, democracy within the party. But even that is not true. In what time there's uh, uh, democracy within the party? Just give me examples. No time. Then it's uh, democratic centralism. Consulting democracy, so nowadays we promote that, like consulting committee, national consulting committee, and so on and so forth. And there's a professor in Stanford, a uh, political science professor. He has some new terms for a consulting democracy, which was uh, very uh, welcome in China by the official leader, uh, officials. That's called a co-formative democracy. And then nine presidents, what does it mean? Because uh, last term is uh, nine uh, members of the standing committee. So people call them nine presidents. That means each one in charge of certain areas. So it's called collective leadership. But meanwhile, that means nobody really, uh, re nobody really responsible for any serious results. So uh, since Xi Jinping's got power, and now became is a one big guy, not the second one to challenge him. So one big guy is himself. If you call dictatorship, uh, if it's a one-party dictatorship with the nine presidents before, but now you can call it dictatorship, it is one party, and also it's a one big guy, as Xi Jinping himself. 
And the fourth one you say the gun ought to be commanded by the party. That's old principles. Uh, that means the uh, armed forces must obey the order of the party without exception. But that's an unusual case during June 4th massacre in 1989. At that time, the general secretary, the top leader of the party is Zhao Ziyang, at least in the form. But Deng Xiaoping at the time is only the military committee chair. And he gave the order to kill students and civilians. But if it is true, with the party gave the order to the armed forces, so that should be Mr. Zhao, Zhao Ziyang, should give the order. But it's uh, actually it's not. So they don't have the universal rule at all. They always change. So just now, uh, one person asked me, what's the way of the decision made? I said, no certain way. Sometimes at random. Sometimes it's uh, just secret. Uh, uh, several few people discuss it. Then ask the political bureau to pass. OK, then uh, if we say, we say something different with their democracy, we would promote constitutional democracy, universal suffrage, representative democracy. So that's libertarians in China. Some of the public individuals, uh, uh, public intellectuals will promote and agree on this. So what is Xi's grand strategy? First, Making China as number one in economy, with more emphasis on the actual control and influence of the world economy. And they are not satisfied with uh, as a follower of the game rules. And nowadays they try to be the setter of the game rules. Then uh, the Chinese regime tried to make or try to build a strong armed force capable of competing in Pacific areas as well as the whole world. Uh, that give example building five aircraft carriers. And also they will try to establish a new ally relationship with Russia with the energy dependence and win-win benefits pattern. Thus they think they would have would have the win-win benefits. But they neglect of the historical lessons. In history, Russia never shows friendliness to China. And they got a lot of, of maybe some people will argue saying in Stalin's time, the same sort of very friendly. But actually, that's friendly in, in, in the, how can I say, in surface. Uh, but the true thing is, they try to make China into the trap. Like the Korea, Korean War, people know that, right? Okay, now this. China tried to make all kinds of the substitutes for all good things. If there's any good thing in the world, China would copy and try to substitute it. So you say Baidu is a searching good tools and instead of Google and Alibaba for eBay, Dundun.com for Amazon.com, Alipay for PayPal, and Yoku for YouTube, Breakspan for the World Bank. And Confucius Academy for GOAT Academy. Partially failed already. And then the China model for Western models, because there's no uh, individual or single model for Western success. So it's nearly failed. No, no people really believe in China's model. Even the official scholars uh, asked them, they said, we don't believe the China model also. Then Beijing concerts for Washington concerts. It has been failed already. And nowadays, uh, they have some, uh, they, they try to get uh, prestigious degrees from US universities or British because uh, they can never do it good with Chinese education system. So they want to borrow those correct prestige, brand names of the education. So they have the NYU of Shanghai campus to train students. Sorry, I know that. Uh, but, you know, the students in Shanghai campus, they must learn Marxism, Leninism, uh, Socialism, Communism. So, the, after that, they can get U.S. degree. <coughs> so, maybe some 
American educators are saying, oh, it's fine, we just make money. So then you give up or compromise in some way. Uh, so cooperation on education programs for degrees, and also there are Stanford Center on campus of Peking University. It's almost like uh, the Western window to favor the Chinese regime. Okay, so the only hope I think is the potential of civil society under the dictatorship and harsh crackdown. Uh, in my opinion, reform is dead and could not be resumed at all. The only source of hope for promoting and implementing fundamental institutional change relies on the civil society. Uh, intellectuals are dividing nowadays into different groups with different goals. Some just uh, became uh, how can I say? They, they will say that they try to help the Chinese regime and give up their uh, basic bottom line. So, solution on internet and media blogging. Uh, now, these people use uh, social media like WeChat, QQ Group, Skype, <laughs> Viper, etc. And also, we have some small group people to get secretly or publicly. Uh, for book reading, salon, email group dissemination, restaurant or tea house, park, garden gatherings, and family gatherings to discuss some sensitive issues. But even that, still, some people, you know, were arrested only because you have some gathering talking about sensitive issues. Sorry, uh, I don't have uh, much time, uh, but I can leave uh, this PVT for people to read. Uh, so here are some hints for uh, demand for international assistance that what uh, people need. I just uh, read it quickly. Uh, we can read it. We'll just go okay. To okay. So, the, okay. So, thank you. As you can see uh, from my title, uh, this is Modi's India. Uh, all discussions today uh, on India revolve around one person, and that's uh, Mr. Modi, who has been recently elected as the Prime Minister uh, of the country. Actually, I don't know if you realize that but the hotel we are sitting in for this meeting is also on Modi Street. The street which hotel I bought is called Modi. Interesting. <laughs> uh, so Modi is everywhere, and I don't know that's good or bad. And I'm hoping that after you hear my brief description of what uh, he is, uh, what he stands for, you may have some sort of better understanding and some insight in terms of how to interpret and how to predict what he's likely to do. So like any good politician, uh, it's pretty difficult to pin down Mr. Modi on any of the issues. Uh, and so I will see in my description how that sort of plays out uh, within India. I don't know if you can read the quote there, but it is a very popular quote that Modi uses. And I'll show you some of the slogans uh, that he has come up with. And that has what made him so popular and so appealing to the larger masses. What I'm going to do very quickly is to give you some background on how the elections were fought, uh, what is the general philosophy that the, Mr. Modi and his political party, BJP, uh, sort of stands for, uh, his focus on execution. Uh, he is a very good administrator, and many people argue uh, that he may not be good in terms of his ideas and approach to markets, but at least he will get things done. And that will be better than having a lame government that we had for 10 years before him. What are the policy reforms that have been sort of done so far in the first 100 days? We just sort of finished celebrations. Well, they finished celebrating their first 100 days uh, in power. So what has happened in the first 100 days in terms of police policy reforms, and also in terms of larger institutional changes uh, in the country. And so that's sort of brief uh, outline of what I'm going to talk about. I think Modi became successful largely because he converted the electoral campaign 
uh, from parliamentary democracy to a presidential style campaign that happens in the US. It was one man, not a political party, not a group of leaders, but one man standing up against the opposition. Right? And that uh, worked very well for him uh, across the country. Uh, despite the fact that most people say all politics is local and therefore most predicted that he could not be able to succeed by presenting as a one-man campaign, uh, like a presidential campaign, uh, but he showed that it could work even in India. I think the biggest thing for him uh, is that his use of social media. Uh, today in India, almost everyone who wants to communicate with Mr. Modi, including the ordinary citizen, can get to him through social media. He has a large number of people uh, reporting to him on a sort of three or four hour basis, on a daily, uh, telling him what's happening with social media, what people are commenting on about his government, about what he's doing, and that actually motivates him and guides him quite a lot. Uh, and I think it's an important part of what we think we should be doing in the country uh, moving forward to promote some of our market ideas. The slogans uh, that have become quite popular, and this is the reason why his uh, sort of one man show, uh, uh, one slogan that of course will appeal to us is minimum government, uh, maximum governance. Uh, that tells you that he is, of course, for limited government. Uh, at least uh, in this particular uh, slogan. The second one also is along the lines of what we would approve of. The government has no business uh, being in business. Uh, and he has talked about this quite often, even uh, as the Chief Minister of the State of Gujarat, uh, where he came from uh, earlier. He has focused on the aspirations of the people, uh, talks about development, politics versus what we in India call vote bank politics. So vote bank politics was largely focused on subsidies and handouts. So you targeted particular group of people, say Dalits, uh, for example, or tribals, and gave them specific benefits in order to attract their vote. And that has been the traditional sort of campaign uh, in India in all elections. Modi, in a sense, for the first time, changed that way of campaigning, that way of attracting votes to focus on the aspirations, to talk about uh, transport, power, economic growth, jobs, opportunities, and that in a sense has appealed to a large number of people. Other part that comes and which is somewhat similar to what we would advocate uh, is, is focus on federal structure, meaning the central government should not be doing all the things as it has been doing in the past. Much of the power and responsibilities should be given to the states and the local government. And that is part of uh, his attraction uh, for many of the state governments uh, who are even in the opposition parties. Some of the things which are very appealing to the masses, uh, this had a coin, a very popular slogan. Uh, in Hindi, it means times much better than in English. Uh, uh, but first, toilets first, temples later. Uh, it's a very good way of sort of giving the message to the people uh, uh, what needs to be done first. Uh, and certainly, it's a very powerful message, very timely message. Uh, it comes up with quite a sort of interesting ways of talking about what needs to be done. Right? Uh, one other slogan that has become very popular uh, is one per drop, more crop. India is still an agricultural country. Almost 60% of the population today depends on agriculture. Right? So he has to do quite a lot uh, in that area. And it's sort of focusing about how to use uh, low water intensive crops, low energy uh, in terms of agriculture, at the same time increasing productivity. Uh, India is, of course, IT capital. Uh, Bangalore, as you know, is Silicon Valley uh, in Asia. Uh, and he has sort of caught on to that idea uh, that instead of being a country of snake charmers, 
this would be a country of mouse charmers. Uh, and as you can see, it works very well uh, with the larger public. This is his sort of foreign policy. Uh, as you know, he was the first prime minister who invited local, in regional, small countries, government heads, like from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka, from Nepal, uh, to attend this uh, swearing in ceremony uh, of Mr. Modi. The first time that happened in the Indian history where a Prime Minister swearing in was attended by neighboring countries' uh, heads of states. And that actually has become a very powerful tool uh, to sort of promote larger dialogue with the neighbors of India who have largely been ignored by the previous government because we are the big brother uh, in the region. Uh, and Modi actually has been focusing a lot more on tourism, opening up borders in a sense make it easier for people to travel across countries, easier to do investments across countries, particularly in the tourism industry, in the hotels and other areas. And therefore, his slogan about uh, tourism unites, terrorism uh, divides. It's a very good way of conveying the message to our neighbor Pakistan and uh, others uh, that this is a common ground that we could have and thereby avoid the kind of battles that we fight at the border which also applies to China. Right? We always have this uh, skirmishes going on in the border with Pakistan and China on a very regular basis. So those are some of the slogans. Uh, what he is sort of known for is his delivery uh, on promises. So, so far, whatever he has promised, uh, he has been able to deliver. He uh, is known for his execution capacity. Uh, that also means uh, that he's reduced number of ministries in the government today. He combined large number of ministries into single, uh, uh, for example, uh, coal, power, renewable energy, where different ministries at the federal government. They are now all in the one single ministry. So interesting ways of thinking about how to reform the governance structure uh, of the country. At the same time, many are afraid that he is a single leader. Like what we used to say about partner of China. Uh, he is a one man show. Uh, no other minister in the government has much power. So he works directly with the bureaucracy, implements his ideas and projects uh, through the bureaucracy, bypassing the rest of the political system. In terms of policy reforms, uh, because I think difference in terms of what we would like him to do and what he actually does, is the difference between pro business versus pro-market. So he has been giving special favors in a sense to businesses to obviously come to India to expand and invest, uh, which are not always pro-market. We don't need to change in the rules of the game. He simply changes the rules for particular businesses at particular points in time. And then that has been one of the uh, common challenge. Uh, I'm sure those who attended the MPS meeting or the Baklal uh, talked about this earlier that we cannot uh, see how this is going to work in the longer run uh, for the betterment of the country. Great idea that he has promoted is repealing 100 laws in the first 100 days. Actually, uh, his office has worked with us directly to come up with the 100 laws uh, that can be repealed in one go. So one single bill in the parliament would repeal all the 100 laws uh, in a single stroke. There's a huge battle going on within the party. Uh, between the people who are pro-market or pro-business broadly and the people who are nationalist or pro what he calls Fadeshi, uh, local sort of production of uh, goods and services. And that actually explains why many of the positions uh, in the government are not yet fully filled. They cannot decide whether to hire people who are pro-market uh, like uh, Professor Panagaria from Columbia University who has been writing and talking a lot for the last couple of years in India in terms of pro-market reforms. A great thing for us, and we, ch we actually cheered him uh, for this, the first thing on the list, he closed down a 65-year-old uh, planning commission of India. This was a one body, like the central uh, planning body in China and many of the Soviet Union, actually planned the whole economy, right, if you can believe that. Uh, and on August 15, 
on the day of India's independence, he declared the planning commission would be abolished uh, from now on. It's a great, uh, great move, I think, uh, uh, for people like us. So quite a few large number of reforms that he has been doing. And I think broadly, we are not very clear. I mean, you have some insights in this as you uh, we talk more and discuss more about this. How to see where is going to go with the pro-market versus pro-business strategy. Uh, and what that's going to mean for India and obviously for the world at large. Thank you, gentlemen. It's amazing that in two such tiny countries we're able to say so much. Uh, we have 10 minutes uh, for some discussion. Uh, there should be some microphones available. And let's start right here. And, and very brief, quick. Real question, no speeches. Um, my name is Jose, originally from quick, Venezuela. Quick, quick, quick. My question is to Parth about energy. Uh, I have followed that uh, President Modi has been announcing a big energy, uh, solar energy plan, so I'm interested in that. Please. Yes, he's a big proponent of it. Uh, actually, next year, Mandela. Okay. 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 What he has done in the state of Gujarat, that we have water canals, right? All the water canals are now covered with uh, uh, sort of solar uh, uh, power, uh, and therefore a lot of solar power is being generated within the state. So I think that's uh, one of the big, uh, one of the big initiative that his government is going to continue to follow. Microphone. Is a suggestion we'll do it in the end, not now. Okay. Right. Uh, Raina, my first question to Shai Yan. You said the role of the civil society now to take care of things in China. Can you tell us a little bit about civil society, uh, free market initiatives in China? Uh, nowadays, uh, there's a very strong uh, crackdown for the intellectuals and lawyers, the dissidents, actually activities in China. So it's uh, even hard for them to get them because uh, global is a national security police. They follow those uh, sensitive persons all the time. Whenever they have their, uh, they want to gather, then they got the message first because they have the telephone tab and can follow the supervision all the time. So it's very hard to uh, communicate. But just now I mentioned there's a few things that people try to avoid. Uh, it's hard. How, how, because there's no organizations, no party can be organized in China. Otherwise, it could be considered as uh, uh, overthrowing the, the party, the government will be arrested in and put into jail. So, it's, people say, where is the civil society? Uh, how do you organize? What's the party's name? We couldn't answer anything, any question like that. I said, uh, all the people, you express your ideas in your Twitter, or Facebook, and anything, but I, I, people know that these two things are, cannot be visited by each other. You should uh, have to uh, climb the wall, firewall first. So it's very difficult. The only thing people can do is say something, the quick group discussion, and we chat, and with uh, the voice expression. So just a very hard and narrow space for them to develop. Uh, uh, from uh, Peter Robert Lyrock Institute of Hong Kong. I have a question for Path. Um, okay, I'm impressed uh, by you saying that uh, President Moody uh, repealed 100 laws in the first 100 days of the administration and also uh, he closed down uh, the planning commission. I wonder how he deal with the uh, vested interest, for example, the employees of the commission. There must be opposition, great opposition to that. Of course, uh, there are 1,300 people employed in the planning commission, uh, but they would not be fired. Right? They are all government employees. So they simply transferred from one department you know, uh, to the other. Uh, so there is no opposition from them, in, at least not directly in public. My question is for Professor Shaw. I was wondering which do you see easier to fix within China, the shadow banking problem or housing situation with all the ghost cities to inflate GDP? Uh, real estate, housing problem? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
people know there's a, actually there's a no real estate market in China at all because it's not competitive because the land resources was controlled by the state. Uh, so when you say that the price should be decided by demand and supply, in China the supply was controlled by the state government and local governments. So uh, the, for many years, especially for a recent 10 years, the pricing uh, is very unreasonable. People think it's uh, some young people after their graduation from college they think they can never in their whole life to afford to purchase a good home for, for them. Uh, they have to have the uh, health assistance from their parents. Uh, there should be some rich people to afford to purchase several houses in China. Uh, but nowadays, uh, uh, people think that it might be kind of hope because the uh, anti-corruption campaign makes some officials, they have to uh, try to sell their houses and transfer their capital into U.S. and some other Western countries. Uh, in some of the single cases, you could see one corrupted official holds more than 300 different apartments and houses in China, different cities, and also some even in Hong Kong and uh, Australia. And so some people, they, they have the house, they have never been into that, that house. I mean, the only with the case or the owner has the case of the, uh, what you call this. Uh, so that's very un unreasonable. Unjustified. Hi, um, I'm Trisha from Ideas Malaysia. Um, my question is for parts. So you talked about how Modi is encouraging even more federalism, but um, India is already lauded, you know, as a, as having a very high degree of federalism and decentralization. Uh, and we in Malaysia are exploring those, you know, opportunities for us. But what is the difference between what he is proposing uh, versus what has already been in existence? Uh, the, I think big difference is in terms of uh, before we had on paper the federal structure, but in practice, the uh, central government collected most of the taxes and the central government gave tax revenue to the state governments in order to implement uh, and spend money. Uh, now, uh, is a fixed formula that they have agreed on through which the central government tax revenue would be automatically given to the state governments without any discretion on the part of the central government. Right? So even though we, on paper, we had a federal structure even before, in practice, uh, central government pretty much dictated what the state government would do by controlling the purse. Uh, that is now changed. So I think that's a very substantial change in practice. Uh, I promised that we would end at 11.20, so we have 10 minutes to set up the next panel. So this will be our last question. Yeah, I have a question for Professor Sa. Is it the real estate problem is more serious in Hong Kong than China? And then also, the Chinese government, they, they have certain, uh, right now, the action on the, uh, the fighting against corruption. So how is the effect uh, to this uh, in action? And also, uh, for the economic reform in China, if you can see right now the, the GDP, and then they are the second world largest economy in the world. So how, how is your comment on this? And also the... Uh, as, as so we have to just, let's stop on that. So we have time okay. to answer. It's two minutes. Uh, I think the, the real estate industry in China is we're going down in some way, especially the, the price, uh, because it's uh, all uh, far from the reasonable level. And some people would, could uh, move their capital uh, fortune to Hong Kong and they can purchase the houses in Hong Kong with Hong Kong real estate price even higher. So that's a tendency. Uh, if you mention about the GDP in China, the, the second largest economy in the world, uh, I would say it cannot, it, it is not sustainable because uh, the, the government got richer and richer, but individual citizens, uh, they, they hardly have a, uh, substantial improvements in their living standards and people feel very hard to pay for medical care uh, for uh, education and a lot of things they, they cannot afford to pay 
So this is not the real economic growth on their people. Okay, we're going to conclude. I will mention very quickly, I was in Shanghai uh, for a program recently with some of uh, Yuliam's colleagues. And uh, although we've heard a very sobering presentation, uh, they're absolutely committed and they're not giving up that, that China will continue to advance towards more liberty and limited government. So there is a very toughness in the Chinese character that they do not surrender. Thank you very much. We're going to set up and start precisely at 11.30, so if you leave the room, come back really fast. <laughs>